Now look, I'm not saying that this is a good PC, let's be clear on that, but for many, this old Packard Bell and similar systems which continue to adorn our high streets today are exactly where many of our PC journeys began. Just like our first cars, it may have been cheaply built, it may not have been the quickest, it may have caused us no end of frustrations, but it's still okay to feel warm and fuzzy about it, and to want to preserve those memories in this object. And that's what we'll start today in our new Trash to Treasure series. This is the Packard Bell Executive Multimedia from 1996. We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, but they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com and we thank them for their support. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. Spread across the desk here is that Packard Bell Executive Multimedia from 1996. I've stripped it down and I will take you through that process shortly and what we found inside there. And um, it's a Trash to Treasure series, which means the objective of this series over the next two to three episodes is to make this neglected looking desktop. And that's all I have at this stage is just the desktop. I don't have a keyboard, I don't have a mouse, I don't have a monitor, speakers, any of that. We're gonna need to source that along the way. And by the end of it, I want to present to you something that looks like it was brand new, fresh out of the box in 1996, using whatever techniques we need to, to get there. And you may be asking, having seen rare and exotic Japanese equipment on the channel recently, why of all things are you giving the trash to treasure treatment to a Packard Bell? Um, a really common system that we would have seen on the high streets, certainly here in the UK, and I'm aware it was sold in the US as well. In every high street, in every town, these things were just everywhere and they're probably still in lofts up and down the country just being neglected as this one was. Well, it's more about the nostalgia than it is the machine itself. And I'm sure many of you will be diving straight into the comments section to say to me, this is a cheap, horrible machine. Why are you giving this your attention? It doesn't deserve it. Others of you will immediately be saying, oh my God, I remember that. That was my first machine. And while this wasn't my first machine, I can understand those feelings because take a look at this. This also got a series a few years back. This is a Packard Bell. It's got a 486 in there, so it's a previous generation to the one that we're working on today, which has a Pentium processor. And um, just as an aside, they're retiring the Pentium name, so that will no longer be used uh, going forward. As of early next year, I think they're killing it. So um, yeah, it's, it's a chance to revisit the Pentium while we do this as well. But this 486 Packard Bell is exactly where I started in IBM PC compatibles, having had an Amiga and an Amstrad before it. This is when I migrated into the IBM PC world. But I look at this machine and it brings back great memories of things like learning how to program properly, um, getting onto the World Wide Web for the first time, just loads of great memories. So when I look at this slightly later Packard Bell, I imagine there are hundreds of people, thousands of people out there who um, look at it and have the same memories as I did. And that's why it would be a disservice for it to end up in the bin. And I think it would be great to restore it, have it perhaps next to the other Packard Bell so that when people walk in, they, it, it will evoke those memories and they can sit down and enjoy it. Um, perhaps without the Packard Bell bloatware that was bundled with it, but we'll cross that bridge if and when we get to it. Now I've had a lot of fun researching this machine, including a trip back to Packard Bell's website, thanks to the Wayback Machine in 1996, in which they invite you to focus on your future. Do not adjust your sets. That is the full weight of 1996 website fidelity. Now this is PackardBell.com's website and not necessarily specific to the UK, but hunting through it, we can find what looks like it's nearly, but not quite our model here. And it's listed as the Multimedia D130. Now it wasn't called that here. If we look at the label on the back, it was called the Executive MM or Multimedia 9005D. So while I think of this as a common machine I saw a lot in the British high streets, it was very much an international machine marketed under different models and names. On the product page, we can see it houses a Pentium 133 CPU, one gigabyte hard drive and 16 megabytes of RAM, which is nearly, but not quite right, as I later discovered when I found a UK catalog from the period. So let's take a look at that for comparison. So this is the kind of brochure we'd have found in shops like Dixon's or PC World on the high street in the UK, promising us the ultimate multimedia package. Inside, there are four machines in the range. We've got two desktops and two tower models, and ours is the second on the list there, 
the 9005D. And if we take a look at the specs, it's pretty much identical to the one that we saw on the website, which I'll call the US model because I'm pretty sure that's the market that it was for. There are two key differences though. In the UK, we have the 8-speed CD-ROM instead of Quad. Why we can't call them octa-speed CD-ROMs, I don't know. I think the, the naming fell by the wayside after single dual and quad-speed CD-ROMs. Anyway, there's that. And then there's the bloat. Hands-free phone, 24 preset FM radio stations, answering machine, remote control, fax, 3D surround sound. Yes, by the mid-90s, the multimedia buzz of the early 90s, when CD-ROM drives became a bit more affordable, had kind of evolved into multimedia slash cram as much as you can into a high street PC. It was almost like they were selling PCs like they were photocopiers with as many functions as possible on them all poorly implemented most of the time. And what's worse, on this particular model, well, they had this thing. One touch access. This is Peak Packard Bell, a block of buttons that sit under your monitor to launch the various applications, providing of course you're using the factory installation setup because if you've reinstalled Windows and not the additional drivers and applications for that, it's probably not gonna do very much at all. Another staple of the high street PC sale at the time was the bundled software package and inflated valuation. Worth over a thousand pounds declares this page, which tells us software such as Windows 95, Echo the Dolphin, SimCity, Coral Draw, Microsoft Publisher, Works and Money, and lots more besides are included. There's even something called soft karaoke with the strap line out of the shower into your PC. In reality, this would amount to a plastic wallet stuffed with CDs rather than the retail boxes. And some were genuinely useful. Coral Draw and Publisher, for example, while others were an opportunity to stream videos or enjoy the capacity of CD-ROM-based software. But most of it would end up in the drawer. So that's what a box fresh 9005D is set to promise us. And in 96, that would have set us back 1,799 pounds, including tax, with an alleged £100 sale discount. And if you were feeling flush, the top of the range model is the 9009E, which is a tower model, with a 200 megahertz Pentium and 24 megabytes of RAM for a cool £2,499. And don't worry, that also includes the one-touch panel. That was 1996, and this is today. Externally, this looks standard with the exception of the duo triduple speed CD drive instead of the stock octuple drive. I'm not really a fan of the text on the front of that drive if I'm honest. Anyway, around the back we've got a video out which is integrated into the system board, parallel and serial, PS2 mouse and keyboard ports, and then we have this all-in-one sound game modem card here. Notice the ports are all colour coded and the original cables would have had coloured labels on them so you know what to plug into where. Pink here is the antenna for the FM radio tuner and FM radio continues to transmit today so that's not in any way redundant, we might actually be able to use that. I also noticed a postcode on the machine. Now this would have been visible under a UV light, but time has made it readable. And looking up that postcode, it puts the owner of this machine near Buxton in a beautiful part of the world called the Peak District. So this was a Northern machine. Aye lad. Speaking of peaks, let's take a peek inside the surprisingly accessible case. There's just the three screws to get inside here. And uh, as we lift the lid off there, it's a pretty typical affair for the period with lashings of dirt sprinkled all over it for good measure. Aside from the modem, audio, FM, radio card, the majority of functionality is built down on the motherboard. The whole thing's going to need a deep clean, so I might as well strip it down and that's why you saw me with it all over the table at the start of this episode. The only fiddly part of the process was figuring out how to remove the plastic front bezel without snapping anything. And I found the key to that was, well, it was this sneaky lower part of the plastic, the gray part, which slides down and clicks out. And that gray does have a bit of a green tinge to it. So we'll want to fix that. But underneath were three screws to remove and uh, then the rest of the fascia came away. Mmm, more Peak District dead skin there, lovely. Now our board came out for closer inspection with a few more screws and then we also had to remove the posts from the rear of the case. So where those ports were, that was just gripping onto the case itself.
and there is our deconstructed system. So how stock is this compared to our pamphlet? Well, let's start with the RAM. We found in here there are four 72 pin SIM slots of which only two eight megabyte sticks are present. Those have a 60 nanosecond access time and with two free slots, we've got room to expand on what appears to be the stock 16 megabyte installed in here. So this is as it would have come. The CPU itself sits under a stock heatsink. There's no fan required on that. Although there is a front case fan, as you saw, filled with dead skin, and there is a fan on the rear of the PSU. So between those, they would draw air through the machine. And we can see after the removal of some very old thermal paste that it is indeed an Intel Pentium 133 CPU. This CPU was released in June of 1995. The first Pentium was released two years earlier in 1993. So we've got a Pentium 133 in here, and it's this era of Pentium that I jumped on board with the Pentium chips. The Packard Bell that you saw earlier, the 486, that came when I bought it with, I think it was an SX25 or 33 megahertz CPU. I upgraded it to a 486DX4100, as I've done with the one here in the cave, and that was a pretty powerful machine. It kept up with the likes of the Pentium 60 and the 75, I think it was, those earlier chips. But one thing's like the 133, the 166, which is what I bought in my next machine, which was a self-built machine, and the 200. Now, I think that's as fast as this particular model of Packard Bell can be upgraded to, a Pentium 200. Um, that's when it really left the 486s for dust, and I got on board and um, enjoyed all of the power that those bought. So I've got a lot of respect for this little era of Pentium, and um, that's another reason why I want to preserve this machine especially, as I said earlier, that Intel are retiring the Pentium name. So all the more reason to have a, a showcased Pentium machine here in the cave. Back inside now, video duties are handled by a Cirrus Logic. It's a GD5440, which is a pretty standard choice. You'd find these in compact desktops, amongst others. It has solid 2D capabilities, but there's no hardware 3D acceleration in this system. You'd need to add that yourself. It looks like there's one mega video memory on board, I think, and there's space to upgrade that in these sockets. And that would open up higher resolutions with more colors if you happen to upgrade that, which perhaps we will if we can find the chips for that. To the left of those sockets is the feature connector. Now you might want to use that to connect to an MPEG decoder card or a similar expansion card that combines its output with that of the onboard video. The sound card slash modem is an exercise in cost saving. Of course, a genuine dedicated sound blaster card is always the ideal choice, but this manages to fudge together a 28.8K dial-up modem and a sound blaster compatible card. There's an Aztec branded OPL audio chip there, and there's a Rockwell chip there on the modem side of things. Everything about this screams you're going to have driver problems, you're going to have a bad time configuring this in DOS. It might just be a case of quietly removing this card from the system as part of our refurbishment plans and installing a dedicated sound card. I don't particularly have a need for a 28.8K modem. It just depends if we decide we want to keep all of this together or make a slightly better Packard Bell out of it. Storage now, and I found the original hard disk is still present with a capacity of 1,275 megabytes as advertised in the UK catalog. So a little bit more than its US counterpart. And this is a Seagate medalist. It'll be fun to see if it still works. We'll certainly give it a go. So that's what we're working with here in my mission, which I'm starting to doubt already was a good idea, but we're gonna push on regardless. My mission to restore this Packard Bell from 1996 and make it look like new. As I said, all we've got is the desktop PC. Uh, we've seen some possibilities to upgrade here in terms of storage, sound card, and um, perhaps bump the video up. Or if we're not gonna put additional video RAM on the motherboard itself, we could just slot in a, uh, a video card. We've got the option of ISA slots as well as PCI slots. So we could have a rummage around in the, in the storeroom and see what we've got that we could possibly put in there. Um, or we could keep the onboard 2D and maybe add a 3DFX card or something like that. We might need to consider what can we actually run with a Pentium 133 and a 3DFX card, is it? Is it worth it or should we just stick to software rendered 3D games and 2D games? I need to just remind myself, jog my memory, what was about in that era and what we might be able to run on it, what visitors might be able to enjoy when they come here. But none of that is gonna happen unless we have monitor, keyboard, mouse, and all of the others. So we need to go shopping and that's exactly what I did next. 
Using the catalog as our guide, I've tried to pair our system up with original, if possible, Packard Bell branded parts. Here's a reminder of the as new look. And here's what I found. Now this was listed as testing and working. It's a 14 inch screen and I purchased it for 45 pounds plus postage. Some of you are probably screaming that I've gone mad already, but uh, those, are, those are eBay prices, of course. There will be plenty of these in people's lofts, I'm sure, that people would be grateful to give away and make the space in their house if you can find one. But for the sake of expediting this restoration and this series, I stumped up the 45 pounds. And if we look around the back, we can see that this was manufactured in September 97, and it also has those speakers clipped onto the sides. So I think this is spot on, and it's shown as tested and working with a nice test image on the, on the front of the monitor there. So we're gonna take a punt on it. That's ordered. Moving to the keyboard, it looks quite square on the catalog with no additional hotkeys on it to launch apps. Now my first search turned up this, which let's be honest, it looks like a public health message from a dental surgery. It's a vintage PS2 keyboard according to the listing title and I quote, has some slight yellowing on the keys. Hmm. On closer inspection, it wasn't a match for what we have, but you know what? I felt so sorry for this that I accidentally bought it for two pounds. We may not use it for this restoration, but we'll take care of it. Now at the other end of the scale, I found this, a brand new, never used keyboard with some typically blurry, low effort listing photos. But I was able to make enough out to be satisfied that this is a very close match owing to the shape. And also, do you see that odd FN slash man menu button? That's just above the num lock and to the left, there's that lone key there for some reason. If we look at the catalog, you can just about make out that key too. It's in the same place. So not only is this our match, it's new old stock. That doesn't guarantee that it'll be working, but it's well worth a punt. And yes, I wince when I look at this, 30 pounds I paid for that. So that's where we are at the end of part one. With all of those parts ordered and incoming, we hope to put the system together in part two, which is going to involve a huge amount of cleaning, retro writing uh, with what we've got. We're gonna to have to strip down that monitor and try and retro the bezel and get that looking like new again. Um, check the keyboard works. We might have a go on that yellow keyboard. I mean, if we're retro writing, we, we might find time to throw it in there. We'll, we'll see what it's looking like. Um, if I even want to touch it, it looks like a bit of a biohazard. Um, maybe it shouldn't even come in the building, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And then we'll have to, uh, perhaps in part two, maybe in part three, install an operating system. Hopefully we'll get to that stage. And uh, well, I'll put out an, an appeal to you guys. It's always easier with these things if you can get hold of the original Restore Media. So if any of you happen to have a CD-ROM out there for this specific machine to restore it, it would be great to be able to put that in and, and do that we might find that the hard drive's working and we can just tidy up what's on there and take an image of it. That would be great. But anything that helps me to get the drivers working, we could even have a go at getting this original sound card slash modem working if we can get hold of that restore media. Otherwise, we'll just rip it out and put something else in there. So if anyone's got that CD, let me know. Um, I'll, I'll look in the usual places. Archive.org has some Packard Bell CDs and there are some other specialist Packard Bell websites out there that can help us. So uh, if you can point me in the right direction for the 9005D UK model, please do let me know. Until all of this arrives and we can get stuck into it next time, thank you so much for watching. I'm really looking forward to building this. Um, let me know in the comments if you are or you aren't really looking forward to this. And of course, your Packard Bell memories, but not just Packard Bell, also those, that whole range of cheap computers um, or overpriced computers with cheap components that used to be on our high streets. Uh, did, you, did you buy one? Maybe you were a salesman. Let us know all of your gory stories, good and bad, from that period. I really look forward to reading them. As always, thank you for watching. Take care, and I will see you next time with the gloves on for a good cleaning session. Bye-bye. If you enjoy what I do here in the cave and you'd like to support it, head on over to patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro, where you too can become an official cave dweller, just like all the names on the screen here. Thank you everyone for your support of the channel. 
Duo Triguple. Duo Triguple. Triguple. Duo Triguple. With the exception of the Dru. <laughs> Duo Trigu. Duo Triguple. The Duo Triguple speed CD. The Duo Triguple speed CD drive. Right. With the exception of the Dru. With the exception of the Duo Triguple. Duo Triguple. Duo Triguple. Of the. Duo Triguple. Instead of the stock. Octuple drive. <laughs>